Why South Sudan? An Every Village podcast where we answer questions about the world's youngest nation. The question of the day is, what is the food like in South Sudan? Hey everyone, my name is Tiana Johnston and I am the host of this podcast called Why South Sudan? where we answer questions about the world's youngest nation. And so today we have Andrew Brown in the studio. Hey, Tiana. (laughs) Welcome back. Thanks. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about something that is just so near and dear to your heart. That is true, (laughs) my favorite topic. (laughs) We're gonna be talking about food. Mm. I know, so good. Which we have talked on other episodes um, about like, oh, do you like, which is, what's your favorite food? South Sudanese food or Ugandan or Ethiopian? Ethiopian is still my top fave. Um, but I thought it would be fun. Um, okay, let's say specifically in South Sudan. What is your favorite food? Oh, specifically in South Sudan? Yes. Ooh, the, uh, the fish probably, yeah. I mean... Uh, although I don't, it, well, it, it depends on the fish because there's definitely some fish that come that have the tiny little bones. I'm terrible at Ooh. picking that out with my teeth. It's just hard. Yes. I, I didn't grow up that way. So the nice thick fillets of fish. Now, I mean, it, none of it, it's on the bone, but it's the, the kind that peels off really easily. I don't even know what kind of fish, but it, there's some amazing fish there. Mm-hmm. No, I totally agree with that. I think my favorite is, oh, it's a kadong. So it's like a sauce kind of um meal <laughs> but it tastes it's more like chicken broth oh it's so delicious and they'll mm-hmm. do it with like with lentils and oh i could just eat it like a dog it's real bad yeah good analogy <laughs> good picture in our brains <laughs> that's a good one yeah okay so that's a great segue diving into what south sudan looks like and what the food there looks like because obviously each area you know i mean even if you think of america our food looks different in every culture in every region so um, yeah, if you want to give me your wisdom, we can just go back and forth. It'd be fun. Yeah, no, that sounds good. I, uh, yeah, I'm happy to start. I will just say I'm really excited about this topic. Uh, I think in a different life, my dream job would be to be a food critic. I mm. love, I love trying new foods, any kind of food around the world and, and fine foods and cheap foods or whatever. And then I love talking about it. So <laughs> as you know, I'll come to the office and I'll have tried something. And that's the beauty of living in Houston as well, because Houston has such a diverse set of restaurants. It's incredible. Like, I don't know, I told you in a month or so, I'm going to an Argentinian restaurant. I didn't even realize we had one. And it's like less than a mile away from our office. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I do love that kind of thing. And so um, uh, food critique is is fun. Um, So the, the food in South Sudan, I mean, obviously... You know, if you've listened to this podcast at all, you know South Sudan is a war-torn nation, and it's uh, you know extremely poor, very undeveloped. They don't have commercial agriculture; it's almost exclusively subsistence farming. So, in that type of environment, the the food palette is quite basic, and and uh, it's mainly staple foods that are meant to fill your stomach, not to provide a whole lot of uh, enjoyment. Mm-hmm. And you see that even in their society right now, eating is not really a social gathering. In most cultures, it is, mm-hmm. but in extremely poor environments, it's not because that's not what where they they you know generate their social activity. Now, I, I would differentiate drinking tea certainly is a very social activity mm-hmm. because of course you can have access to tea no matter how poor you are. Mm-hmm. But but eating itself is not particularly, and it's fascinating because I, I don't remember whether we talked about this or not. But you know we we'll go to you know dinner at the homes of some of our staff, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. And it's always so funny because you. They invite you over, and it's an honor to be able to go over to the home and eat. You think to go over and eat with them, but that's not the case, right? Yeah. They serve you the food and then leave the room, and mm-hmm. so you're eating by yourself. <laughs> kind of funny, but it's so different than what we would think of as having a meal over in somebody's home is the social aspect. Mm-hmm. Or well, for them, it's the honor of the hospitality, right? Mm-hmm. So when it comes to the foods that they eat, I mean, you know, you, you, you got to start with sorghum. I mean, that's the, that's the staple crop in South Sudan every um, South Sudanese pretty much is going to eat that. And certainly the areas we're working is almost exclusively sorghum. Mm-hmm. And um, so much so that it's funny because I remember in 2016, we were uh, doing a radio training um, and uh, the the trainer that had come to, to teach our radio staff was teaching them on interviewing skills. And so he broke them up into pairs and they were doing interviews with one another. And two of our staff, the, the question he, the prompt that he gave to our, the interviews was to ask the person that they were interviewing their favorite food, which is a funny question. Like for an American, that sounds pretty easy, 
you know, softball pitch question. But in South Sudan, that's kind of hard, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, anyway, so <laughs> two of the guys, I, I still can just picture it and laugh. Two of the guys were paired off and the interviewer asked, what's your favorite food? And the, the other guy was just kind of being funny. Um, and he had traveled a little bit. He'd been, he'd gone to university in Uganda for some time. And he said, bananas. <laughs> and And without like total straight face, total reaction, he wasn't like pretending the interviewer said immediately responded that's not a food <laughs> <laughs> and we all started laughing because you know to him food is sorghum mm-hmm. like it's not a meal unless it includes sorghum right mm-hmm. everything else is for basically for children or whatever it's snacks mm-hmm. and so anyway um that's just a funny little story to show you the importance of sorghum and and uh, typically harvest time is about uh, september you know late august september which means that every year um, August, you know, really is kind of the hungry month. Um, they're, they're, they've sowed their crops. They're waiting for the harvest to come. And their stores from the last year are starting to wear out and they don't have enough food. And year after year, people are in a situation of food insecurity, hunger, sometimes even starvation, depending on the, the weather patterns and, you know, how the crops came in. It's such a sad reality of South Sudan. But anyway, sorghum is kind of the place to start. But I, I, you, you list some, some foods as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think of I mean, peanuts, they call them ground nuts there. That is very, very a huge staple. So sorghum has a lot of protein, which is so good, but um, so does peanuts. So praise the Lord for providing peanuts. And so, I mean, I would go to my friend's houses and they'd be grinding and making like a peanut butter, basically peanut butter. Um, And they would sometimes put it with a tomato, which actually tasted really good. I never in a million years would be like, oh, let me put some raw peanuts, um, like peanut paste with uh, tomatoes, but it was actually really delicious. Granted, I think we've talked about it before too, like just fruit there, like even a tomato just tastes so good in South Sudan. (laughs) I mean, I was eating it like an apple. Like it's so, so good. You don't have access to a lot of fresh foods because the harsh environment. And so when you do, you know, have one, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. No, it really is. I mean, even in thinking of mango season, um, which is currently (laughs) going on right now, which is so, such a huge blessing. Um, it's just like a sweet, sweet gift from the Lord (laughs) to have in, um, such dry places for sure. But, um, another thing that they do, which, um, we had talked about was like Kadong. So that is just, and so combo is another one. So it's a seasoning that they add to like meat or a sauce, um, that a lot of people really enjoy to eat. And so they use the sorghum. I can't remember. I remember one time when I, it was like, I first got there and there was like this big mound of like white, I mean, it literally looks like mashed potatoes. And I was so excited. Like, I was fresh off the plane, y'all. I didn't know what I was doing. And they're like, oh, yeah, you take this and you dip it. Um, And a fun fact with South Sudan, you always eat with your fingers. Uh, You don't have silverware, uh, which I thoroughly enjoy. Um, I don't. (laughs) I miss it. I really like it. (laughs) I've gotten used to it. (laughs) Um, And so using your fingers. And so you, like, dip it and then you eat it. And I was so excited thinking this big mound of fluffy white... um, food was mashed potatoes and it literally was so bland no taste i mean yeah. just <laughs> yeah and and i i'd mentioned sorghum is their staple crop and i forgot to mention for people in america that haven't had sorghum yes. what it is but yeah it's it's it it looks like mashed potatoes i guess mm-hmm. but it's a stickier thicker consistency not as soft and it's almost like i don't know whether play-doh is a good description yeah. or something but it's mm-hmm. it's just very clay-like almost yeah and it's i mean it fills your stomach but it's very plain so without any sauce it's you know extremely plain um and but th- that's why they mix it with sauces like you're saying and you know sometimes it's just broth sauces mm-hmm. um you know if they're at if you do go to a restaurant um mm-hmm. you know it's not uncommon to to get meat so uh, goat is the probably the most common meat um that they'll eat um and they'll boil the goat um, they'll sometimes roast the goat. My Ooh, preference roasted is roasted. Goat. Yeah, for sure. And that's mm. kind of going to be the closest uh, um, style of meat that we would be experiencing in the West. The boiled meat, not as much. Um, mm-hmm. It's tough because, I mean, again, you understand why, but they're they're eating all parts of the animal. And they, they don't really worry so much about, you know, certain types of cuts. They're just putting it all in. So that when they when they chop up the, the goat or the cow, whatever you're having, they're just, you know, chopping it up. And there's all kinds of parts in there. They're boiling it. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I don't want to gross people out. But the truth is, I mean, it's not the most hygienic environment. And so I've, I mean, I'll just, you know, we've, we've 
we've told stories on this podcast, <laughs> but I mean, I remember one one time in the last couple of years, I was we went we just opened up a brand new repeater tower in Napagok uh, mm-hmm. outside of Tonj. And so I went to visit it for the very first time. And there's a lady uh, who now works for us as the cook for the, the staff there. But at that time, she was just kind of volunteering and cooking. She lived right by the, the tower. And so I went over to her house uh, for lunch. After, you know, we'd, we'd driven out there uh, quite several, several hours. And it was really kind of her. She served sorghum and, and goat. And, um, you know, it was a feast, right? And and some bread. And uh, and I looked down, and to, you know, as I'm starting to try to start to eat it, and I look down and I see some hair, um, goat hair, yeah. not, not unusual. Mm-hmm. And I pick it out and then I see some more and I pick it out. And after about the third or fourth time, I was like, you know what? I better just stop looking because that's just, it's, it starts to gross you out more and more. Totally. And I'm like, but I've got <laughs> to eat this. And it's, it's lunch and it's an honor and all that. So I just kind of stopped paying attention and just kept eating. And it, that, that's tough, right? And yes. it's the same, you know, you'll bite into a part of an, a piece of meat. And it's not what you expect. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Right. That literally happened to me. I went to a friend's house and she, you know, it was some holiday. I can't remember. But we were going over there. And so she served us this whole platter and everything. And I got so excited. I literally dove so fast for this meat. And I literally thought it was like roasted goat. It was liver. Like, oh, my goodness. I was so thankful because. In South Sudan, you, a lot of times your dogs will follow you around. Um, and so Hachiko, our <laughs> compound dog, followed us. And I was so grateful because I was like, oh, no, I cannot do this. <laughs> I had to give it to yeah. her. Otherwise, if you were there, I would have you to yeah. eat it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'm kind of the human trash can, right? <laughs> yeah, the uh, the other one is, is you know, they, they do sometimes eat pasta. Uh, that's not mm-hmm. like a traditional food. But nowadays with, you know, some access to commodities from North Sudan or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they like eating pasta. Um, and it's more, I mean, it's like, sometimes it's macaroni. It's not, you know, it's not, um, Mm -hmm. it's just random stuff, um, that comes in for the market. But, um, so sometimes you'll see what you think is pasta and you, you start eating it and you realize, no, this is intestines, (laughs) you know, and it's in this goat sauce typically. Right. And so, yeah, you just, you, you never know. It's so true. Um, The other funny one, I was just telling somebody this the other day. I don't remember. Uh, you know, I'm not a big breakfast eater, mm-hmm. um, but in South Sudan, they'll, they'll come and they'll serve us breakfast as well, which is nice. And, you know, I, I'll take tea every morning or coffee. Um, but um, but in a wheel, especially, they started doing this. And I actually kind of like it. It sounds weird, but mm-hmm. I actually kind of like it. But they serve spaghetti with sugar on it. So it's just plain spaghetti noodles with sugar. And it's lightly <laughs> sugared. It's not like really heavily sugared. It sounds kind of gross or, or it's certainly unusual, right? But it's actually... It's kind of nice. And for breakfast, it's it's so funny. But they'll just, you know. So they don't, the South Sudanese, again, because of their history, they don't have a mm. uh, a defined meal palette like a lot of the world as well. Like this is a breakfast food. This is a lunch food. This is a dinner mm-hmm. food. It's just about filling yourself up. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter whether it's at, in the morning hours or the evening. You eat what you have when you have it, you know, so that you fill up, right? Mm-hmm. And so you see that. I mean, I've, I've you know, we had... When I lived over in Uganda and we had the South Sinese out for radio training and they came over to our home for dinner and we served carnitas and um, we intentionally wanted to give them, and my wife made it, and we intentionally wanted to give them something they would have never had before. And in Uganda, it's tropical environment, right? So they have pineapple and mango and, you know, guava and all, all the fresh, you know, tropical fruits that you could think of. So you always have that as a kind of a side typically, right? Mm-hmm. And so, of course, for us, if we saw carnitas, we would, you know, get the tortilla and the meat and all the toppings for that and put it in there. And then we'd put this fruit to the side and eat it with our fork on the side. Yeah. And I didn't, honestly, we prayed and I explained the meal a little bit to the guys, but I didn't think about like telling them what goes with what, right? Mm-hmm. And so they just pile everything all together and they start eating and, and they don't think anything different about that it. Totally it's not, makes sense. It's not yeah. even, to them, it's not even like a gross factor. It's just, yeah. you know, so it's just... Yeah. Like that's their exposure to, mm-hmm. to cuisine, isn't mm-hmm. it? Interesting. It's so true. Yeah. Ooh, one of my favorites, I guess let's say quote unquote breakfast, but because they do tea multiple times a day. Yes. And or they do a little bit of tea with their sugar. I know it's true. <laughs> it is really true. It's like people here in America with, with coffee. Like, yes, yes. A lots and lots <laughs> of sugar in there. So much. Yes. But, oh, man, with the mandazi. So mandazi basically is like a fried bread. So it's not so much like a donut it's more on the bread side 
Yeah. Man, oh, if if so people good. have had beignets for yeah. people from you know Louisiana or whatever, this is a little bit thicker than a beignet. Yeah. A beignet is a little bit airier, but you know mm-hmm. it's it's like that. Yeah. Really oh my good. goodness! You like dip it in because so they have two different types of tea. So they call it chai is one, and so that one is just like the basic, um, like brown tea, which is actually quite delicious. And then the other one is um made with the hibiscus mm-hmm. tea. Kitty kitty day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, good I love job. It. That's yeah. great. You said uh, it right. It's so good. Yeah. 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 Oh, man, that is like, it's like a thick syrup, but oh, it is so delicious. Mm, yeah, and it's so deep red. Like, yes. yeah, yeah, it's, uh-huh. it's really, really yummy. Yeah, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about fish, of course. There's, you know, and that's seasonal. Um, yeah. I remember um, in Mavolo being in, um, I think it was June, probably. It was the summertime. Um, and, um, and no, no, it couldn't have been. It must have been earlier in the year um, during the dry season. So the, the end of the dry season, one of the rivers that, you know, the rainy season, the rivers get really high mm-hmm. and then the dry season, they get really low. And this one part of Ton, uh, Mavolo, mm-hmm. um, the river shrinks to the point where there's just this um, cut off pond every year. It's a lowland that uh, that the fish are caught in. And so it's probably, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe three or four acres of, of, of land. It's just this uh, swampy area with fish caught in it and they have nowhere to go because it's cut off from the river. Well, once a year... Uh, the whole community, hundreds and hundreds of people gather on on that day, agreed upon day, and they line up at one side of the pond with their spears, and they're just in this long line, and they just start walking shoulder to shoulder, spearing the the ground and catching fish by the dozen. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of fish. And I happened to be there that day. And uh, I had some meetings that morning, so I didn't get out to go till the afternoon. So most of the good fish were caught. But it's fun. I mean, I didn't. I, I I just wanted to get out there to experience it. It wasn't like I was trying to catch fish. But I <laughs> I I mean, it's it's kind of yucky, very muddy, and all that. So I just stripped down to my my boxers <laughs> and went out there. And I've got a picture of me holding up somebody else's fish. I didn't actually catch one, but it was it was a fun experience. So. That's so cool. Yeah, I know fried fish is so good. Mm. Um, the dry fish just can't do it's it. Strong. Have you done it? Have you tried it? I, I mean, I've tried it. It's not, you know, it's not as bad as it smells. It smells, oh, it smells very strong, terrible. of course. <laughs> but again, I've had a lot worse things. So, yeah. you know, some of my fun stories, well, you know, things that are just so unique there, right? Yes. They love their cows. We've talked about their love for cattle mm-hmm. in in the, the Dinka and Nuer cultures, especially. And so milk, of course, is a big thing. We've talked about that at the cattle camp where boys will just live on milk for months at a time. Mm-hmm. Um but, uh, you know, they will also make, um, so uh, if you don't know sorghum, one of the products of sorghum is tapioca. Mm-hmm. So that's where we get tapioca from. So you can make little um, tapioca, I don't want to call it pudding, but I mean, I guess you could call it that. It's a little bit thicker than a pudding. Um, and I've had it before where it was so delicious. Uh, one of our, our uh, ladies on our compound makes it and, and she'll lightly put sugar on it. So it's a nice little sweet dessert. And, um, and so, uh, a couple of years ago, I was there with uh, one of my pastor friends and it was his first time in South Sudan and they brought out lunch and I saw this tapioca dessert and I, I told him, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm really excited. I love this. It's so good. And I'd had it several times at mm-hmm. the same place. And so I loaded up my plate and it wasn't, you know, it was going to be on the side for after lunch. And, uh, I started, I took the first bite. And it was just this immensely strong flavor in my mouth that I was like, I couldn't place it at first. I was like, what does this taste like? And I wouldn't say it was terrible, but it was so strong. Mm -hmm. And then it hit me and I was like, this tastes like a cattle camp smells. Mm -hmm. Like incredibly strong smell of of flavor of cow. Mm -hmm. I was like, why is that the case? It took me a minute to figure out. And then our South Sydney country director, Dan Laval, was was sitting there with me and he was laughing a little and he, he knew. And then I was like, then it hit me and I realized, oh, they put cow urine in it. <laughs> so that's not uncommon for them to spice up their food with cow urine. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll do it in, in milk um, and it'll curdle the milk a little. Mm-hmm. But it also, you know, it acts as a steril- sterilization. It cleanses it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's a very strong flavor. So I kept eating it. Um, you know, it's it's not my favorite thing in the world. It sounds particularly gross to us Americans, but there's worse things, right? That's so, very true. anyway, I don't know. It's it's just interesting, you know. Yeah, so. no, it's true. I know out in the Mavolo area, not Mavolo actually, in the Luo area, um, outside of Tange, um, cassava root was really, mm. really like it's known for that area. But the crazy thing about the cassava root that we learned is that if someone dug it up too early and they ate it, it actually could cause blindness. Yeah, and paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, it's, uh, I've read that in a book where there was this huge, it was before people realized this, a huge 
they thought an epidemic. They thought it was a disease causing mm -hmm. mass paralysis. And they didn't know what it was. And they finally figured out what it was is that there had been a bad crop um, uh, harvest that year mm -hmm. and people were desperately hungry. So they were eating cassava pre-cooked or, or uncooked, which they normally don't. Mm -hmm. And it was it's causing permanent paralysis. It's terrible. Oh, and yeah. then that's how they discovered it. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And cassava, if you haven't had cassava, is a root super dry and chalky. I don't mind it. Again, it's kind of plain. It's, it's I guess, like a potato, but a lot drier than a potato mm -hmm. um, and uh, starchier. Um, but yeah, uh, so that, that, that's an interesting one. They, okra is another Ooh, common yes. uh, Delicious. crop. Some, some pumpkin, yeah, which I was are really say nice. Pumpkin. Yeah, yeah, those oh are really gosh. good. Boiled pumpkin is, Ooh, boiled so pumpkin good. and boiled peanuts yeah. are really delicious. Oh, yeah. Oh, I so, should do so it here good. in America. Why have I yeah, not done I, that? I, we've, I've, we've made an African stew here in, in the States oh. um, with pumpkin and pe uh, peanut butter. Ooh, really yeah. delicious. But the yeah. pumpkin, oh, man, it's just so, so good. So when we lived there, we actually taught um, Christina and Teresa. There are house helps there. And we taught them how to make. So pumpkin in Arabic is abudo. And so we called abudo cake. And so mm. we just taught them how to make pumpkin pumpkin bread technically yeah. is what it is but yeah. oh my goodness everybody like they always requested it they always wanted it like everyone loved it so so much so we did it for like birthdays yeah. and stuff like that which and they're still fun. making it even though you've been gone a long time so oh, it's, it's so fun. good yeah. that, and that's kind of the fun thing as well as is you know they because you lived there they learned to take the same ingredients they've been making but make things in different ways than they've had it before mm -hmm. and of course we learned to try things in ways we've never had it before as well and that's kind of fun some of those fun sharing things so it's true yeah, yeah. i mean we taught you know them how to make like fluffier bread because normally they do make bread there um so they'll do more of um so it's like in it was like injera so in like the ethiopian which um, is explained to our audience what injera is okay injera is basically it's actually just this like flat i'm trying to think of the flour that they use it's, yeah uh, it's it's one of those flowers that we don't usually typically teft. use that's what it is teft okay. yeah okay. and so but i think you can use multiple ones because teft isn't in south sudan but it's basically it's very it's like kind of very thin and watery and so it doesn't puff up like a glutinous um bread would um so they don't let it rise or anything like that but it's very like thin and watery kind of like well, a i would crepe. call it spongy yeah like a crepe yeah crepe. not watery yes. but spongy spongy for mm -hmm. sure yeah um and they don't like ferment it long so because in ethiopia a lot of it is like more fermented so it has like a sour taste but the one in south sudan doesn't but yeah you use it just as if you would use um like the sorghum mm -hmm. um that you dip it in things or you wrap it around um the meat uh, but that was really good. But we also taught them how to make kind of like fluffy bread. And so everybody loves that when they go to visit. Yeah, yeah, baking. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's, uh, I don't know. It, it's it's definitely a, a fun aspect of, of culture uh, anywhere you go. And um, and the more, you know, you get to know the people, the more, you know, experiences you get. And so, and, you know, I figure whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're a living proof of that. <laughs> So I'm willing to try everything at least once. <laughs> I know. I love that. You're actually heading out on a trip fairly soon. So excited for you and definitely please eat a lot of food for me. I will. Well, that's I will say this is I, when I first started going years and years ago, I would say, you know, not that I, I don't fluctuate weight a whole lot, but I mean, you know, I definitely would maybe lose a, a few pounds on a trip um, just because it's a different palate. But I've been working there so long and now I've, I've come to to love the foods more and and also our, our our ladies that work for us now just make mm -hmm. way more variety than they used to yes. um there, there's more access to things in the market and they've learned different things so anyway i definitely typically like gain a little bit of weight on my trips now <laughs> which is so unusual <laughs> and it's not how it used to be but oh well <laughs> i know a lot of people do come on trips and they bring a lot of like um granola bars and jerky and nuts but then they start eating the food and they're like oh i don't even need that like this food is actually really really good yeah yeah, yeah. it's really good well and and more than important than it being good it's just again an honor to mm -hmm. be given such a, a precious gift uh, from the south Sinese, and they don't have a lot and so when you see them preparing a meal for you it's Mm -hmm. there's just something significant in that and um and i love i love it so it really is um we'll end on a fun fact um so in their culture if you actually burp or belch after a meal that actually is a compliment which i know is very backwards from here i guess you fit in there <laughs> tiana um so a little bit about me i'm a country girl <laughs> 
It's, and my boss is not. It's not a compliment here in the United States, which I do have to remind you sometimes. <laughs> But it was so funny because I would, you know, obviously after a meal and they would be like, ah, they would say like, thank you or like, praise God, because they (laughs) they took it as a compliment. It was great. (laughs) So Uh, I love that we can connect with all (laughs) all people groups. That's great. (laughs) Well, thanks so much for sharing today. This is fun. But please eat some really good food for me. I will do it. Yes. Oh. And take pictures also. (laughs) All right. So we invite everyone back to the next episode as we answer the question, is South Sudan mentioned in the Bible? Take care.